Hello. Welcome to this lesson on descriptive statistics. This is ITE 1812 Mathematics for IT. We will first look at the learning outcomes of this lesson. So by the end of this lesson, uh, you should be able to uh, compute mean, uh, median, and mode for a given data set and use quartiles, range, and variance for summarizing data, as well as generate box plots representing descriptive statistics of a given data set. So what are the descriptive measures uh, that we look into in this lesson? So we can summarize these measures uh, that describes a given set of data. Uh, some measures are about central tendency. They will be mean, median, and mode. And some measures will be about variation. We will discuss about quartiles, range, and variance. And there will be also measures of shape. We first look at measures of central tendency. Take first the mean, which is the most common measure of central tendency. So this mean serves as a balance point in a set of data. Mean is also called as average. So how do you find the average or the mean? Uh, you add up all the values and divide that sum by the number of values. So that's what is basically given in the equation you see on this slide. So it is usually denoted as bar. So where the random variable is x and x bar denotes the mean of the data set. Here we have a simple example. So the following table shows the absentee list of drivers uh, of the transport department over a span of 90 days. Uh, so you have uh, drivers from one to 10, and for each driver, you have the number of days he or she has been absent. So you have to find the average number of days the driver is on leave uh, in 90 days. So how do you get the solution? So you can compute the mean by adding all the data values and dividing by the number of data values. So you see, you add up all the number of days of leave for all the drivers, eight plus six plus six, seven, and so on, and divide that by the number of drivers. You get uh, 55 over 10, and the average uh, days per driver out of 90 days and the average leaves uh, per driver out of 90 days would be 5.5 days. That's a straightforward example. Now we move on with the arithmetic mean of group data. So this is the mean when data are summarized with frequencies and uh, the calculation of the mean is done by using the equation given on this slide. So here, K is the number of classes and Fi is the corresponding frequency. So we go through an example, uh, consider the frequency distribution shown in scores of 20 students in a science test. Uh, find the mean marks of the students. So we have in this table uh, marks given by X and the frequency. So students having marks 40 would be one, 50 would be two, uh, 60 is four and so on. Um, so you have 20 students in total and you had to find the mean marks of the students. So how do you do that? You need to calculate the F times X values for each instance, right? So F is the frequency, X is the mark value. So for the first instance, you have to multiply 40 by one. Second instance, you have to multiply 50 by two gives you 100, 60 by four gives you 240 and so on. And you take the sum of all the FX values. And you have the total frequency, which is 20, the number of students, and you divide the sum of all the FX values, that is 104. 1470 
and divide that by the number of students, that is frequency. The sum of the frequencies, which is 20. And it gives you 73.5 as the mean mark of a student. So that's when you have frequencies and corresponding values. And now we move a step further uh, to find the mean of summarized data with classes. Uh, so we can adopt two methods in this case. One is the direct method and number two is the step deviation method. So in direct method, uh, we use this equation given on this slide to calculate the mean where k is the number of classes, fi is the frequency of the ith class, and mi is the mid value of the ith class. So in this case, you have class intervals. Now we will take an example to understand this better. So in this table, you are given the height in inches of 100 boys in a class. So you have to calculate the mean of the given data set. So, so height is given in class intervals, 60 to 62, number of students, that is the frequency is five, 62 to 64, number of students is 18 and so on. So in total, you have 100 students. So now you are required to calculate the mean. And so how do you approach this? You need to have the midpoint. The MI value represents the midpoint of each class. So for the class number one, which is height 60 to 62, the midpoint is 61. And you multiply the midpoint by the frequency. So 61 times five is 305. So you do the same procedure for all the classes. And then you can get the total of or the summation of FI, MI values, which is in this case, 6,558. And you have the frequencies summed up together, which brings 100 at the cumulative frequency. So to obtain the mean mark, what you do is uh, you divide the sum of FI, MI values and by the sum of all the frequencies, which is 6,558 divided by 100, you get 65.58 as the mean height. So that was the first method with which we call the direct method. Uh, we can also introduce the step deviation method. And in this case, uh, the equation used to calculate the mean is what you see on this slide. Uh, X bar is equal to A plus uh, the summation of FIDI divided by the summation of frequencies times W. So let's uh, uh, see what these uh, symbols represent. K is the number of classes. A is what we call the assumed mean. So in this calculation, we assume a mean and based on that, we continue the calculation. And W is the width of the class interval that A lies, because we have to select a certain assumed mean and that assumed mean lies in a certain interval and W is the width of that interval of the class. And DI is the deviation of I class from the class that A lies. Okay, we will take an example to describe and understand this better. So here you have uh, marks obtained at an examination uh, into various classes. So these marks will uh, populate uh, students into various classes. Um, so you have class intervals, 10 to 14, number of students is four, 15 to 19, number of students is five, 20 to 24, 11, and so on. So we have the frequencies listed in the second column. So you have to find the mean of the above data. So how do we approach this? So you first look at the class intervals. You have to uh, come up with the boundaries, the class boundaries. So for the first class, uh, you have that as 10 to 14, you need to uh, calculate the lower and upper boundaries 
for each class. So the class number one, 9.5 to 14.5. And the corresponding frequency is four and the midpoint is 12. And special value here is the deviation value. So in this example, you see that 27 is taken to be or identified as the assumed mean. Okay. So the class belonging to class that belongs the assumed mean is the class number four, which is uh, originally from 25 to 29, that uh, 27 lies, right? So here, uh, the boundaries we have identified as 24.5 to 29.5. So you notice that in that class, the DI value is zero because that is the class that contains the assumed mean. And all the other classes have values either positive or negative or DI. So if the value, uh, so how do you calculate this uh, DI value? So all the classes that come before or lower than, values representing lower than the class that is having the assumed mean value, they have negative values. So the class just adjoining the class that's having the assumed mean, it has val DI value as negative one. And the next, the next class is having DI value as negative two. And the, the class after is having DI value negative three. Similarly, for the classes above, so the next adjoining class has DI value positive one, next one has positive two, next one positive three. So even if you had more classes, uh, depending on where the class lies, you have to add either a negative value or a positive value for this DI value, right? So you can understand how these DI values are assigned. So it's the deviation. So go back to the definition. DI is the deviation of ith class from the class that the assumed mean lies. A is the assumed mean, right? So once you have this uh, FI and DI values, you can get the FI DI multiplication for each in instance, and finally get the summation of FI DI values. And also you have the uh, summation of frequencies to be 40. And uh, the summation of FI DI is negative 50. So how do you now calculate? You have to use the equation provided, which is A plus summation of FI DI divided by summation of F times the width, right? So substitute those values. 27 is the assumed mean. Summation of FI DI is negative 15 and summation of frequencies gives you 40 and the corresponding class width is five. Which class is that? That is the class containing the assumed mean. So you simplify, do the calculation and it will give you the mean to be 25.125. So this is how you calculate the mean using the step deviation method. Okay, so now we list out some properties of the mean value because this is heavily used, very commonly used concept. Um, so we can define the mean value, it exists. It always exists and it is unique. Given a set of data, you can find the mean and it is unique. And mean uh, depend on the extreme values. So for example, if a certain data set has extreme values, uh, very high values or very low values, uh, it will affect the mean value. So mean, in other words, mean value dep depends on those extreme values. And the mean takes into account every item of the data, not just a selected number of items, but it takes into account all the values. And the fourth property is the sum of deviation about the mean will always add up to zero. Okay, so in the equation form, it is given as the summation of xi minus x bar. That is the difference between a given value and the mean of the data set. 
And if you add those values, if you get the summation, it will be zero. So this is one of the properties of the mean value. And now we introduce the concept of uh, weighted mean. So let's try to define this. So if you have values x1, x2, up to xn, uh, they are values uh, whose relative importance is expressed by a corresponding set of weights. These are set of numbers from w1, w2, and up to wn. So these are called the weights, and they correspond or they relate to the relative importance of each x value. So in this case, how do we calculate the weighted mean? So x bar w, uh, on the numerator, you have x1 w1 plus x2 w2 up to xn wn. And on the denominator, you have all the weight values, the summation of all the weight values up to uh, starting from w1 up to wn. So this is how you calculate the weighted mean. We'll take an example. So if an instructor counts the final examination in a course, four times as much as each one hour, one hour examination. So you are required to find the weighted mean of a student who received 70, 54, 73, and 67 in four one hour exam and a final exam marks of 76. So final exam is given a higher weight, all right? So it's uh, four times as higher as the one hour exams. So how do you calculate it? You use this equation for the weighted mean. So you have all the XW values, that is X1, W1, X2, W2. So we have five instances here. You can identify the final exam as well as four other one hour exams. So for all the one hour exams, weight value is one. And for the final exam, weight value is four. So what you do, uh, you have to multiply each of the scores obtained for one hour exam by one and get the summation. And you have to add four times the mark obtained for final exam. That is four times 76. So that's the special case, uh, which has more weight. Okay, And then on the denominator, you have uh, all the weight values, one plus one plus one plus four, which gives you eight. And uh, as the numerator, you have 568, uh, which should be divided by eight, which is all the summation of weight values and gives you 71 as the weighted mean. So you have to calculate the weight values uh, in this case. Okay. So with that, we move on to the next concept, uh, the next measure of central tendency, which is the median. So which is identified as the middle value uh, when the observations are arranged in an ascending or a descending order. So you have to arrange the values. And when you arrange the values in an ascending or a descending order, the midpoint or the mid value is taken to be the uh, median. But uh, if the, there are even number of observations, there would be a slight problem. Uh, so in this case, the sample median is the average of the two middle values. So it only happens when the observations are even in number. So that can happen in a real scenarios. So in general, median of a set of n items is the value of n plus one over two item. Okay, so we'll take examples later on. You're given to identify what is the median uh, return for the five portfolio managers with 10 year annualized total returns, record of 30%, for 15%, 25%, 21%, and 23%. So what do, you, what do you do first? You first arrange the returns in an ascending order. So when you arrange that, you have 15, 21, 23, 25 and 30. So median value is, uh, as we de defined previously, it is the n plus one over two item. 
Okay, so what is the n here? n is five because we have five instances, so five values, right? Five plus plus one over two. That is the third item. Okay, so that's uh, given by the equation, but it is not hard for us to understand that it should be the third value because we have five items in this case. So value of the third item is 23%. Now, from for this data set, the median value is 23%. We move on to calculate the median of uh, summarized data without class intervals. Um, so in this example, we have uh, median, uh, we have the um, values for weight in kilograms and the number of students. So we have frequency. So which means uh, with uh, the weight 22 kilograms, we have now seven students, 25 kilograms, we have three students and so on. So we are not given class intervals, but rather actual values. So when the data are summarized with values, uh, first arrange the data in ascending order or the descending order uh, with their respective frequencies. So what you do is here, you take all the values and order that in the, or sort that in the ascending order, which gives you uh, in the table at the bottom, in the first, first column, you have weights 20, 22, 23, 24, 25, 27, and 30, and so on. Uh, so when you do that, then the frequencies are accumulated and the position of the median is the value of, once again, n plus one over two item. So uh, in the table at the bottom, you have the frequent corresponding frequencies in the second column, and then you take the cumulative frequencies. So five plus seven is 12, 12 plus four is 16, 16 plus one, 17, and so on. So how do you get the median? In this case, you have to get the midpoint from the cumulative frequency. Uh, so n is 25. So you put that into the equations once again, uh, 25 plus one over two, that is 13. So 13th item is 23, 23 kilograms. So when you arrange that in a uh, ascending order, right? So in this case, the median value is 23 kilograms. So you have to arrange all the values Okay, so even if you uh, have multiple instances of for each value, you have to arrange all the values in the ascending order. Now, the next step uh, to calculate the median of summarized data with class intervals. Um, so this is the equation, what you see on the slide, uh, which is used to calculate the mean for this instance with summarized data with class intervals. So the equation is given as median is equal to Li plus N over two minus Ci minus one times W over Fi. So let's try to understand uh, what are the symbols representing. I is the median class because now we are talking about class intervals. Li is the lower boundary of the median class w of the class width of the median class and fi is the frequency of the median class and ci minus one is the cumulative frequency of i minus one class we will once again take an example to understand this so the following table gives the frequency distribution of the number of orders received each day uh, during the past 60 days at the office of a mail order company. You have to calculate the median. So number of orders are given in uh, classes. So zero up to 10, frequency is four, 10 up to 20, frequency is six and so on. So you are required to calculate the So in the first column, you have all the classes, zero to 10, 10 to 20 and so on. In the second column, you have the frequencies and third column, you have the cumulative frequencies. Four plus six is 10, 10 plus 10 is 20 and so on. 
So first thing you ought to do is you need to find the median class. So to do that, you get the equation n plus one over two. N is 60, 60 plus one over two gives you 30.5. So that's the item you need to look for uh, as the medium, median item. So median class interval is identified as 30 to 40. So now, since you identified the median class, you can apply the equation given in this slide. So Li plus N over two minus Ci minus one times W over Fi. So Li is the lower boundary of the median class, which is 30. 60 uh, should be substituted as N and 60 over two minus ci minus one is the lower class of the class preceding to the median class. So here 20 is the value should be substituted for ci minus one. So w is the class interval of the median class, which is 10 and fi is the frequency of the median class, which is 60. And you do the calculation and you will get 36.25 as the median value. So this is how you calculate the median for uh, data set with class intervals. So now we list out the properties of median. First one is median is unique and it exists always similar to mean and it does not depend on the extreme values. So if you can remember, uh, the mean, it depended on the extreme values, but median does not, because we are focused on the mid value, not the extreme values. And the actual values of the data set are not uh, utilized in computing the median. So uh, when you identify the midpoint, you are focused on the midpoint, but not all the values in the distribution. And also median is not necessarily a particular observation of the data set. It can be some other value. So these are the properties of median. Now we move on to the next uh, measure of central tendency, which is mode. So we identify the value that appears most frequently in a set of data. Uh, this is identified as the mode. A set of data may have one or more mode or more than, um, can have one or more modes. The distribution with only one mode is said to be unimodal. Um, if it has two modes, we call it bimodal. Uh, sometimes uh, the set of data may not have a mode as well. That is also possible. So we take an example. Uh, here you are given the sizes size of shirts manufactured by a tailor. Uh, so you have given a set of values uh, for the sizes 32, 33, and so on. You have to find the mode of the data set. To do that, you need to find out the frequencies. So you have all the unique values, 32, 33 uh, in an ascending order. So you find that 33 is the value appearing most of the times the most frequently appearing value is 33. So that is the mode of this data set, 33, which is pretty straightforward to calculate. Now we go into a little bit complicated situation where we have summarized data with class intervals. So we have here defined uh, an equation for mode uh, for a summarized data set with class intervals. So here uh, we should identify the symbols. I is the model class and Li is the lower boundary of the model class. W is the width of the model class and Fi is the frequency of the model class. And Fi minus one is the frequency of, of the I minus one class. That is a class before the model class and Fi minus if I plus one is the frequency of the I plus one class, which is after the model class, the class after the model class. Take an example. So these are daily profits uh, in rupees, 400 shops uh, are given in this table. 
So this is a class intervals. Uh, so profits uh, listed as class intervals, zero to 100, 12 shops, 100 to 200, 18 shops, and so on. So you have required to calculate the median. So how do you approach the solution? You have to use the equation that we described in this slide. So you have to identify the mode class. Um, how do you do that? You look at the frequencies, okay? 27 is the highest frequency. By that, you identify the modal class to be 200 to 300. And then you have to substitute in the equation. So Li is 200, which is the lower boundary of the model class. Fi is 27, which is uh, the frequency of the model class. And Fi minus one is 18, which is the frequency of the previous class. Fi plus one is 20, which is the frequency of the next class. And W is 100, which is the width of the model class. And what you do is you have all these values, you substitute in the equation and you get the value for mode to be 256.25. And moving on to properties of mode, uh, it is possible that mode does not exist for a certain data set. But in the previous two occasions with the mean and the median, we noticed that it is it always exists, but not mode. It can uh, be uh, unavailable as well. And mode also does not depend on the extreme values. So we are focused on the frequency, how frequently a certain value is appearing. That's how we calculate the mode. The actual values of the data set are not utilized in computing mode, similar to media. With that, we move on to measures of variability. So up to now, we have been discussing about measures of central tendency. The thing we, is uh, with the measures of central tendency, they do not completely describe the distribution. So it's not a complete representation of the data uh, because it does not take into consideration what we call the dispersion. So now here with measures of variability, we try to include the measures of dispersion or variability. So measures of variation determine the range of the distribution uh, relative to the measures of central tendency. So some of the commonly used measures of variability are quartiles, range, and variance. So we will take one by one and try to understand what these are. So first one is range, simply defined as the difference between the largest and the smallest value. It is uh, not very complicated. So put that in an equation, XM denotes the maximum observation and X0 or X0 denotes the minimum observation. You take the difference between those values and you arrive at the range, very simple. So it is identifies as the simplest measure of variability. Uh, but the problem with that is it ignores a good deal of information because it only considers the mi minimum and the maximum values. Um, so it gives no weight to the central values of the data because it only considered the extreme values. So it usually identified as a poor measure of dispersion. So sometimes we use it, but uh, it can not represent the whole picture about the data set. Example, um, so what is the range of a five-year five year annualized total returns for five investment managers if the manager's individual returns were 30, 12, 25, 20, and 23. So how do you do this? We just have to identify the minimum and maximum. So 30 is the maximum, minimum is 12, and the range would be 80, very straightforward. Here are the properties of range. Uh, it is easy to calculate as we have seen, and it always exists, and it depends completely on extreme values. So number three uh, is one of the main drawbacks of the measure range. So that's why we should look for better representations. 
like variance. So variance uh, takes into account how all the observations in the data are distributed. And it takes into consideration each value of the data. So that's why it, it is a much more complete representation. So if the value, if the different values in the data are reasonably close to each other, or close to the center, I should say, um, or in this case, we can rephrase it as the mean. So if it's too, if it's uh, quite close by to the center or the mean, then we can identify uh, that there's very little variability uh, or the or dispersion in the data set. If the if almost all, I mean, most of the values are close to the center. On the other hand, uh, if the data is quite widely dispersed and at a considerable distance from the center or the mean, uh, we can call in such instances, the data is highly variable. Um, so the measures of variance and standard deviation uh, measure such variability. So we will see in the next steps how to calculate these measures. So we now define population variance and standard deviation. So let's take uh, values x1, x2 up to xn uh, to be n observations of a population. Uh, the population variance sigma squared is given by this equation. Summation of all xi minus mu squared divided by the total number of occurrences or the n observations. Uh, mu is the population mean. So we have a special remark to notice. Uh, the positive square root of population variance is called population standard deviation. It is denoted by sigma. Sigma squared is various variance and square, uh, sigma, which is the positive um, square root is called the standard deviation. So taking another uh, viewpoint, sample variance. So previously it was population variance. And now we look at sample variation and standard deviation. So take an, exa take an example where you have a sample uh, including values starting from x1 to xn. Uh, this is the sample variance s squared is given by a similar equation. Uh, so here x bar is the sample mean and n is the sample size. So here, special remark, the positive square root of sample variance uh, is called the sample standard deviation. And it is denoted by S, capital S. You take an example here, uh, six mid-cap mutual funds uh, on which five-year annual returns are positive 10.1%, positive 7.7% and so on, you are given the set of uh, values, you have to find the sample variation and the standard deviation. So how many values do you have here? Six values. So to find the sample variance, you first have to find the mean of the sample. Okay, so find the x bar. So how do you do that? So here the you have all the six values in the sample. You add up those values and divide by the number of uh, number of samples. So that is six. So you get x bar to be nine point seven. So now next step is calculating the sample variance s squared, and you have to use the equation. Uh, summation of xi minus x bar squared divided by n minus one. So you get all the, uh, you have all the xi values, 10.1, 7.7, uh, 7, 5.0 and so on. And uh, you get uh, all the square values. And then you already found x bar and you can substitute that value 9.7 uh, 
and divide by n minus one, which is n is six, you get six minus one, which is five. And you eventually calculate the sample variance to be 8.14. So how do you get the sample standard deviation? You simply take the square root of the variance and you get 2.85% is the sample standard deviation. So this is how you calculate, given a data set, this is how you calculate the sample variation and the standard deviation. Now, next step. So we try to find out the population variance for summarized data with values. It is given as, um, so now here you introduce the term frequency, okay? Sigma squared, which is the variance, is the summation of Fi times Xi minus mu squared divided by N, okay? Which is the population size. So K is the number of values, uh, and uh, n is the population size. So once again, similarly as before, sigma would be the population standard deviation. So similarly, for similarly as before, we define the sample variance for summarized data with values. So once again, uh, you have the s squared, which is the sample variance. It is equal to the summation of Fi times Xi minus X bar squared divided by N minus one. Uh, K is the number of values and the Sigma of Fi, that is the summation of Fi is all the observations. Uh, so special remark is once again, S is the sample standard deviation. So we take uh, an example scenario. So you are given a table of data, which shows the social responsibility among uh, 209 companies in a particular year. So you are given the contribution values from 10 to 30 and the corresponding number of companies, uh, which is the frequency uh, ranging from 30, 34, 45, 55 and so on. So here you are asked to calculate the variance and standard deviation of the population, okay? So you have to go by the population variance and standard deviation, okay? So in the graph at the bottom, you in the first column, you have all the XI values, uh, which is 10, 15, 20, and so on. And then the, all the frequency values in the second column, 34, 45, and so on. And then you have to have XI, FI values, to go with the, uh, the, the equation and also xi minus x bar values because you can find out the x bar value um, as the, uh, the, the, the mean, the mean value. And then um, you have to also find, then you take the square of that value, xi minus x bar squared value. And then you also have you can also calculate uh, by multiplying with the frequency, you can calculate Fi times Xi minus X bar squared value for all the instances, all right? So you get the summation. Uh, so for the variance, um, so you, you, have, you first have the, uh, we first have the, uh, the, the mean, which is mu uh, as, summation of fi xi divided by the total uh, number of uh, occurrences, which is the summation of frequencies, which is 209. So 4,150 divided by 209, you get the population mean, which is 19.856, because you need the population mean to calculate the next values, which you need, which you require to calculate the population variance. Now, when you have the X bar or when you have the mean, uh, which is mu population mean, then you can um, substitute in the equation for the population variance. So you have all the F values, which are the frequency corresponding frequencies, and you have the XI values, which are the X values basically. 
and you have the population mean calculated in the previous step. And you get all the xi minus mu squared times fi values uh, as the uh, numerator. And that value is uh, 8,795.4 divided by the total uh, the population count, which is 209. And it gives you uh, the variance as 42.08. The population variance is 42.08. So when you have the variance, it's uh, quite easy to calculate the standard deviation. Um, so the variance of uh, social responsibility among 209 companies is 42.08. And the standard deviation, you take the positive square root, which is 6.48. So standard deviation is taken to be 6.48. Right, so that's how you calculate uh, the variance and the standard deviation uh, given a population or a sum. Right. Now we move on to the next concept, um, which is quartiles. Okay, so in this concept, uh, we divide a, a given distribution into four equal parts. Okay, so the dividing points are 25%, uh, 50%, and 75%. So quartile one which is 25% of the data set, they are less than or equal to quartile one, so Q1. So Q2, which is actually the mean, uh, is 50% of the data set are less than or equal to quartile two. And the next one, quartile three, 75% uh, of the data set are less than or equal to quartile three. So when you have to do this, when the data is arranged in an ascending order. So for a given data set uh, or summarized data set with values quartiles one, two, and three, um, it can be found as follows. So Q1 is the value of N plus one over fourth observation. So this is for Q1 quartile one for the first quartile. Second quartile, Q2, value of n plus one over two observation. And quartile three is three times n plus one over four observation. So this is how you find uh, the corresponding quartiles, which are Q1, Q2, and Q3. So let's uh, take one more example. Uh, so you have to find the first and third quartiles for the following distribution of returns. So you are given a set of values. Um, so first thing you want, want to do is you to have to arrange uh, these values in the uh, ascending order. So you get the eight, 10, 12, 13, and so on. So how do you find the first quartile Q1? So you substitute uh, in the equation, you have to get the n plus one over fourth observation. So n is in this case, the number of uh, values that is 12. So you substitute 12 plus one over four is the 3.25 observation. So, so this, in this case, it's a decimal representation. So you have to um, get the decimal part into, into consideration as well. So how do you do that? You get have to get the third item plus 0.25 times fourth item minus third item. So you know the fourth item and the third item, you can calculate those uh, values, according, substitute those values accordingly. So it is eventually coming down to 12 plus 0.25 times 13 minus 12. So 13 is the fourth item. 12 is the third item, right? So eventually it is calculated to be 12.25. So this is the quartile one, first quartile, Q1. And then we are required to find the third quartile. So you basically use the equation, value of three times n plus one over four, fourth observation. 
So n is once again 12. So you substitute uh, and it gives you 9.75 observation. So how do you get that? So get the ninth item, which is 19. And similarly, you have to do a calculation 0.75 times 10th item minus 9th item. Okay, 10th item is 23, and 9th item is 19. And you substitute accordingly and uh, do the simplification, and you get 22 as the third quarter. So Q1 is 12.25, and Q3 is 22. So, how do we interpret? these results. So we have Q1 and Q2. Q1, uh, uh, so this means uh, taking into consideration the first quartile, this means 25% of the all observations lie below 12.25 percentage and 75% of all the observations lie below 22%. And the rest is uh, above 22%. So we have to identify the three different points. Q1 representing 25%, Q2 representing 50%, and Q3 representing 75%. So these are the special points when you consider the quartiles. First quartile, second quartile, and the third quartile. So now, since we know what the quartiles mean, we can define the interquartile range, IQR. So this is also a descriptive statistic used to uh, summarize the extent of the spread of the data. So how do we calculate the interquartile range? It is pretty straightforward. It is the distance between first quartile and the third quartile. So first quartile, we identify that as 25th percentile, and third quartile, we identify that as the 75th percentile. So IQR is the difference between Q3 and Q1, Q3 minus Q1. One more example. So you are given a distribution of data uh, with Q1 is 11, first quartile is 11, second quartile is 27, and Q3 is 42. So how do you find the IQR? Same, very simple, Q3 minus Q1, which gives you 31 in this case. With that, uh, we move on to the, uh, the last concept that we are going to introduce, which is box and whisker plot. It is sometimes called just the uh, simply box plot. Uh, so this is a visual display uh, of some of the descriptive statistics of a data set. All right, so you, you try to include uh, information regarding a certain data set. So it uh, generally shows the minimum value, the quartiles, Q1, Q3, Q2, and Q3, and the maximum value. So these five numbers from the five number summary of the data set, and is, it is represented in a graphical manner. So take an example once again. Uh, so the following data set uh, shows the number of customer arrivals to the shop during past 11 days. Okay, so you have data for 11 dates, and you are required to draw the box and whisker plot. So for, to draw this, you need to uh, find, uh, you need to have the values minimum and maximum, as well as the three quartile values, Q1, Q2, and Q3. So minimum is uh, identified as zero, uh, maximum is identified as 52, and quartiles to be Q1 is 11, so you can, um, you can use the previous equations you identified uh, to get the Q1 and Q2, Q3 values. So here in this example, these values are 11, 27, and 42. So you draw the box plot um, like you see at the bottom of this slide. So you represent um, the box. In the box, you represent the Q2 in the middle. Q3 on the right edge of the box, and on the left edge of the box, you denote the Q1. So that's the box. And what we call as whiskers, you have to represent the minimum and the maximum values. 
So what you see on the left whisker is the minimum value, which is zero. And what you see on the right whisker is the maximum value, which is 52. So this is the representation uh, we understand or we identify as box and whisker plot or just the or simply box plot. So it gives us important information, which are minimum, maximum and the quartile values regarding the data set. With that, we conclude the session on descriptive statistics. Thank you for listening. In the next lesson, we'll be talking about probability. Thank you.